Thank you, thank you to all of you who do support Bioneers, every one of you. We, we know you and we love you, thank you. Um, so our last keynote of the morning, I'm gonna intro here. Here's a startling image to illustrate today's unequal income distribution. Suppose that every person in the economy walks by as if in a parade. Imagine the parade takes exactly an hour to pass and the marchers are arranged in order of income with the lowest incomes at the front and the highest at the back. Also imagine that the heights of the people in the parade are proportional to what they make. What you'd see mostly is a parade of dwarves with some unbelievable giants at the very end. In the final fleeting seconds, you'd need a telescope to see the heads of the financial titans poking through the clouds. Today, five, five billionaires have as much wealth as half the world's people. If billionaires were a country, they'd be the third richest nation after the US and China. Yeah, wow, billionaire nation. A handful of multinational monopolies dominate virtually every single sector. What could possibly go wrong? <laughs> it's well documented that excessive inequality and corporate concentration fuel volatility and crises. They undermine productivity and lower wages. They retard small business startups and growth, and they freeze social mobility. All this results in underinvestment in infrastructure, education, technology, and environmental protection. This preposterous hyper-inequality is inherently anti-democratic. It's make feudalism great again, and it's pushing us off the planetary cliff. How do we break this vicious cycle? What kind of system would work better? And just what is the economy for? Gar Alperwitz and Ted Howard started the Democracy Collaborative in 2000 and subsequently the Next System Project to start creating the structural economic changes we most need to democratize wealth and access to capital. They offer practical antidotes for creating resilient local living economies, stable families and communities, and green sustainable practices coded into the business model itself. Over the past 10 years, while an intolerable level of economic pain and planetary peril have passed the boiling point, GAR has played a central role in creating the quiet revolution of on-the-ground models and experiments in economic democracy. He's among the most important practical visionaries advancing public ownership, community and worker-owned businesses and cooperatives, and intergener intergenerational community wealth creation. Gars had a distinguished career as a historian, academic, author, and political economist. He was the Lionel R. Bauman Professor of Political Economy at the University of Maryland. He was a founding fellow at the Harvard Institute of Politics, a fellow at the Institute for Policy Studies, and a guest scholar at the Brookings Institution, among many prestigious positions. He's written con countless influential articles in the nation's most prominent publications. His many books include classics such as America Beyond Cap Capitalism and most recently the game-changing organizing handbook Principles for a Pluralist Commonwealth. But Gar has also operated on the front lines of real world politics. He ran House and Senate staffs and did policy planning in the State Department. He's run hardball political campaigns and he's been on the receiving end of them. He was the cloak and dagger liaison who bravely managed the leak of Daniel Ellsberg's Pentagon Papers to the New York Times in 1970. He understands hard-headed political pragmatism too well to dabble in utopian follies. If we're going to end state capture by big business and radically transform our economic system to reclaim our ecological well-being, collective wealth, and our democracy, Gar will be looked back on as a leader among dwarves who cut giants down to size. Please join me in welcoming Gar Alperowitz. Society, civilizations, in some sense, are like our bodies. If there's something systemically wrong, it's manifesting all over the place. Um, in all our organs, and that seems to be what's going on in our world at the moment. The system is failing all around us. 
Our infrastructure is falling apart. Our jails are full and can't hold more people. Our young people are burdened with a trillion dollars in student debt. We're in a heap of trouble. When the temperature of the Earth is starting to rise, that's a very bad sign. Our Earth is running a fever, and it's running it because it's sick in many ways. In a country like the United States, the fact that anywhere from 45 to 50 million people are hungry, this is a problem. We can't go on like this. We can't keep moving toward climate catastrophe, nuclear war, persistence of inequality, poverty, famine. There is a systems problem. These are not one-off issues. They are interconnected, and we have to look at the system as a whole. It's time to talk about alternatives. It's time to talk about what's next. We need to be aspirational and be clear about the vision of the world that we want. What is the system that humanizes us? What is the system that opens up our imagination and possibilities of cooperation? Nothing is more important right now than to discuss how can we bring about this change. As systems fail, individual and community creativity explodes, and that's what we have seen. People in this country are solving the problems themselves. They're coming up with new models and strategies. And within those models and strategies are the kernels of a systemic way to move forward. Land trusts. Cooperatively owned businesses. Sustainable energy. State-owned banks. Urban gardening and urban farming. These small successes taken together are a proof of concept that this can happen on a larger scale. We're compelled to search for alternatives, not just analytically, but in how we live and what we do, how we organize our daily lives. And that has tremendous potential. Our actions and our imagination have to match the magnitude of this problem. We have to get out of our comfort zone. We must think with courage. All bets are off in terms of our previous thinking, our ways of thinking about the economy and our ways of thinking about politics have proven an abject and utter failure. The good news is we have no choice but to adopt revolutionary thinking. I like that. That's the exciting part about this moment. When there are no rules, then people have freedom to invent and to create new things. I have no doubt that we can create a better America. If the people who cared about these things really join together to do something about them. Anything is possible. The biggest worry for me is that we don't try, is that we don't push for what we know is right, for what we know is possible. It's time for everybody who cares about this country and the future of the planet to do something about it, to get involved we can actually do better. We can build a better system. It's not impossible. It's a very American thing to do to build a, a new system. It's a challenge. We can do it collectively, neighborhood by neighborhood, step by step. I think that the world that we're on the verge of is bright and beautiful and interesting one. Complex, local, interconnected. I hope we get there. time to talk about what's next. Please come and sign our statement at thenextsystem.org. So these are, uh, instead of giving you a thousand examples of what's going on that moves in the direction of building the next system, those websites, we've been collecting story after story, study after study. So if anybody asks you, how do you do this stuff? you have an answer, at least a place to look for answers, because there are thousands of people working with a vision of how to actually change the system. So that's a, that by way of introduction. And secondly, by way of congratulations to Bioneers. It is a spectacular achievement, and you are, you are the representatives showing that. If there's, if there's one thing I'd like to do is to take this abstract idea, the system, and, and I'm talking to the person sitting in your chair, <laughs> and bring it down to 
instead of, oh, that's too complicated, that's too hard, bring it down to what is it I can do tomorrow to change the system or more specifically, I'll put it carefully, to lay down an irreversible foundation for transformation. Let me say it again. The task in this period, in my view, is to lay down an irreversible foundation in projects, in organizing, in politics, etc., which cannot be reversed, that establishes the basis for a transformation. That's not saying tomorrow I will change the system. My heroes are the civil rights workers in Mississippi in the 1930s. We don't know many of their names. They laid the foundation for the 1960s. That is where I think we are. And to see ourselves in that role, I think is empowering, and we're seeing a lot going on. Let me start at the other, one other end. Everybody knows we live in something called corporate capitalism. Now, that means there's extreme concentration of wealth ownership. The top 400 people have more wealth than the bottom half the, half the society. 400 people. More wealth than the bottom half. It's 150 million, 160 million people. There's extraordinary income inequality, ecological damage. We know all about this. But the systemic problem is how you organize an advanced system so that you can reverse these trends with the institutions moving with you rather than against you. Now, the dominant institutions, you know, in the medieval times, it was the church and the medieval lords had the land and they had the power. In the modern corporate system, the people who have got the corporations have the money and the power and overwhelmingly influence politics. The temporary model that we were brought up with, and I worked in the Senate with Gaylord Nelson, the founder of, the, of Earth Day, in the 1960s, there still was a sort of countervailing balance to corporate power, particularly on environmental issues. Surprisingly, since people have different views of the labor movement, the labor movement was part of that. Gaylord Nelson, the founder of Earth Day, was a labor lawyer. He depended on having labor support in order to do environmental work. Labor unions in the United States, and this is the systemic design we lived with, have collapsed from 34% of the labor force. They are now down to 6% of the labor force. There is an overwhelming attack by the conservatives and by the corporate leaders to drive it further, and they are becoming a weak, weak force in politics, which means that Gaylord Nelson, if he were alive today, probably couldn't be elected, and he probably couldn't do his environmental work. So that's, a, that's one way of thinking about that systemic design, corporate domination of the main sectors, but countervailed and counterbalanced by another system. Other systems, just to oversimplify, the state socialist system kept all of the ownership in the state and all of the power concentrated at the top, and the ecological damage and, and many other damage to human rights, et cetera, in that design was overwhelmingly negative. And I do want you to think about design. Those are two. So the system problem, not only how do we get from here to there, about which more in a minute, what is the nature of the design that you would actually want to live in? How, who would own things? Where would the power come from? Would it be an expansionary system? Corporations have to expand. They've got to keep reporting more profits, and that has environmental implications for big corporations. So what is the nature of the design? This is your problem, not just mine. This is our problem. What does it look like? What would it look like in the ideal? And then how do we get from here to there and what kind of models can we experiment with? That's the nature of this program we call the Next System Project. At one level, for those of you who are interested, and we've given you the websites, we have a major debate going on amongst theorists and academics and activists on design of different systems. Part of it, there are anarchists, visions, there are social democratic, there are liberal, there are corporate, there are state socialists, there are new inventions beginning with community. 
And if you f go to that website, you can follow the different debates. Let me put it this way. If you're serious, you can follow the debates. <laughs> if you want to change the system, you might actually figure out, you might actually, I'm a great fan of the, women, the women's movement of the 1960s. You might actually call together six friends, get some pizza and something to drink, read some of this stuff and say, ah, that might make sense and we could start here tomorrow. In other words, get it out of the abstraction of the academics. There is a lot there that can be bu built on and worked on. The other way to start is with projects. Now, everybody, everybody ne necessarily begins with projects, but some of them have implications that are systemic in their design. And I want to talk to you about a few that are on the ground right now because there's an extraordinary amount of exploration going on around the country. But systems are about what the institutions look like and how they're designed. So here's one that we've, we've worked a lot on in Cleveland, Ohio. Some of you may know about the Evergreen Project. Now this is, some of you do know about it. This is, this is in a very poor neighborhood, 40,000 people, mostly black, average unemployment 20%, family income average 20,000. Very poor neighborhood. In the middle of that neighborhood is the Cleveland Clinic, Case Western Reserve University, and University Hospitals. All three of those institutions, Medicare, Medicaid, education money, have a lot of taxpayer dollars in them. They buy a lot of things just to exist, and they can't move. They are so-called anchored, because they're a huge investment of capital in those buildings and, and all that facility. This is a te technical term these days, anchor institutions. So one of the designs that we've developed, and this is one of many, there are a lot of people experimenting with this, is could we use the purchasing power of these big institutions, focus it on this community, establish a community-wide nonprofit corporation to, to benefit and to reflect the community as a whole's interest, and attach to it worker-owned companies. That is a systemic design in miniature. And yeah. what's interesting about it is it begins with the principle of community, not corporation, not state socialism, but local community. And it has attached to it another idea, worker ownership, which is not community, it's worker ownership cooperatives. It moves in that direction, but it has a narrower focus. And then I'm going to use a dirty word. It also has a planning system. What do I mean by that? Public money in these big institutions focusing downward to help stabilize the community is a planning system. It's not simply the market. It may be checked by the market. The market forces may make these guys a little more competitive. That's fine but it stabilized that way. If you did it nationally, and remember General Motors and Chrysler collapsed the US government and socialized them, and if you had transformed them into mass transit and high-speed rail, and then put those contracts into communities to build that stuff, you would have a larger version of the Cleveland model. Incidentally, the Cleveland model has a, uh, there are three major industries there. One is a very high, it's probably the most ecologically advanced uh, industrial scale laundry, 300 workers in the Midwest, maybe in the nation. And then it has a, a large greenhouse, produces something like 4,000 heads of lettuce a, a, a month. I think that's the number, right? That keeps changing. Then there's an installation, a green, an electronic installation, and also the most advanced solar installation company in the Midwest is also one of these worker-owned companies attached to this community complex. So what you see there, and the reason I want to emphasize it, it's been picked up now in Preston, England by the Labor Party. Who knew? But Preston has now advanced that whole idea and it's become the whole policy of the Labor Party and is now being picked up in European countries around the, around the kind of courageous cities movement of some of you may know about when it's going on in Europe. The, the many, many cities started in Madrid trying to say, our community is the starting point of how we build a system. Yeah, hold on to that. Hold on to that, because that's a different design. 
It's not corporations, and it's not state socialism, and it's not small business. It privileges community and institutionalizes it somehow, in this case, a nonprofit corporation, in the case of Preston, the city government, which is very like a corporation, and it makes that the centerpiece of the design and then builds out from there. It says, we want to build community. And if you don't have community, you don't solve a lot of problems, including ecological problems. So that's one principle. And there's a big debate about that. That's what the debate is about, how far to go with that. And I invite you into that debate, because who else is going to do this but us? I am talking to the person in your chair. <laughs> so that is one way of thinking about what you could do either at the local level or in the example of mass transit and high-speed rail when General Motors and Chrysler went down nationally. But I want to give you another piece of the puzzle. That is something very rarely talked about in this country, but needs to be faced directly. This is a continental scale system. It is literally an empire. Internally, you, you know, I'm going to ask you a question. 3,000 miles coast to coast, roughly. 340 million people building up, roughly. Uh, tell me how we have participatory democracy in that. It's a system that is gargantuan. And in the 1930s and the 1920s, and now a resumption, the question of scale itself is very important. To the, to the extent that you believe the system must be highly centralized, you lose participatory democracy. If you go all the other way direction, you lose the benefits of scale. So it is a real problem, not a phony problem. I want to focus it more directly because I have a hunch about this and we're studying it. Where might you see the idea of dealing with the scale problem experimented with thoughtfully and intelligently, where might that happen in the United States? By way of comparison, just let me mention to you how big we are. You can drop Germany into Montana. You can drop France easily into Texas. This is a very big empire internally. If you think about where the fault lines may occur and where the debate might begin for the longer term re-democratization of America, meaning regional decentralization as part of the puzzle, community, worker, state, regions, California is an obvious target. <laughs> we may learn something from the last election, but you are so far advanced in many ways, particularly on environmental issues, and on high-speed rail and on use of the public facilities, that the possibility of beginning over time, remember my heroes are the people in the 30s, laying down groundwork step by step, for developing a realistic, practical vision of how we decentralize as we move the population from 350 million to 400 million and 450, where it is inevitable that we have to decentralize. This is the most interesting part of the country where we could actually begin that experimentation. Oh. I'll come back next year. I want to hear what's happening. <laughs> so beginning to think about systems not as abstract things for an academic debate, but how would you actually begin to practically to build on the existing models? So what we're finding also is the notion of public as in who gets to own and control, how do we see that in more practical terms? One of the most interesting things that's happening around the country, and it's happening here in California in particularly, is the, the idea of building banks that are public banks. Yeah. Yeah. One, we were, we we're going to have some, someone on the panel this afternoon, we we're going to talk a great deal about the public bank movement, but it is spreading all over the country unexpectedly that we have the notion that we could set up public banks and draws on the Bank of North Dakota. Some of you probably know about that. North Dakota currently is one of the most conservative states in the country. It has the most radical banking system in the country, which, which derives from people 100 years ago who built it. And they kept it, the conservatives kept it because it's so good. The small businessmen, the farmers, the co-ops, everyone likes the, the Bank of North Dakota. 
and it's become a model around the country. There are, I think last time I looked, maybe 15 different places where people are trying to set them up. It's, it's of that order. The, the uh, governor of New Jersey ran on state banks. So what's important about that, some of them are going to work, some of them are not, some of them will pass. But notice that somebody has figured out it's time to talk about institutional shifts, not just policy and not just activism, but actually looking at the inst the, one of the central institutions of the system, the banking system, and saying, why could this not be made much more responsive to the public by changing the ownership and control? And it is happening. <laughs> let, let me say a word about that. As a, I wear a hat as a historian on Mondays and Wednesdays. <laughs> I think people don't, and I'm talking again to the person in your chair, I don't think people believe, and Kenny opened the door on this big time in his opening talk and they opened it again, I don't think people actually look in the mirror and say, I could actually participate in changing the system. That's, that's a hard confront. Who, me? Who else? <laughs> But I want to suggest that there are places, I've given you a couple of places where you can do two things. You can start looking at concrete elements of the system. A system, after all, only is a lot of elements pasted together in a particular design. This one gives predominance to the large corporation and to the money behind it, so they overwhelmingly run the game now in politics. But if you built up a mosaic of alternative institutions and a movement, environmental, political, cultural, feminist, non-feminist, et cetera, that actually began to understand that the way to make progress on all of these things is going to require us to change the powerful institutions that we are confronted with, then it becomes less abstract, less academic, please less academic. Don't make the system problem an academic problem, though we need really good academic research. But see it as something that is our problem. We could do this if we wanted to, like those people in the 1930s in Mississippi. So I want to make it, it's an existential confront, not an intellectual confront, though there's a lot of intellectual work to do, and it's, not, and it's a political confront as well. Now what, we've, what we're seeing now is the worst ends, and it's going to get worse certainly before it gets better, given this government. But the most important thing about Donald Trump is that there was, there's no labor union backing of the, of the Democrats to organize a power base against him. That's what happened. And then he exploited that very powerfully against a candidate that you know, was not successful in many areas. We need to build up, now I'm not talking now about system design, but it's related. We not only need to build a vision of a different kind of system design and a pathway, and a personal role, but also on the way up, how do we build political economic power, not just movement power, but institutional power, like the labor movement did to support Gaylord Nelson so he could do environmental work. What's interesting about the kinds of things that are happening around the country, the Cleveland model, the Evergreen model, etc., is that they also, in the building, in the building become a place where you can build political and institutional power even as you're laying groundwork for a larger systemic vision. So if you take these abstractions seriously and then break them down as always looking in the mirror tomorrow morning saying what's your next move? You can begin to see pathways forward in many parts of the country and I, I don't have time to go into all of them, but we're going to have some discussion in our panel by one of the leaders of what's going on in Jackson, Mississippi. That's one place we're going to do something. There's some very interesting transformative work going on with tires in Los Angeles. Just practical experiments to give you a handle on some of this. So I think I, my time says that I'm running out of time, but I want to leave you with this one last message that if you can bring system design down from the clouds, Think about it almost like a recipe that you want to decide to change or make or, you know, I can do this too, it's not too big for me. And then think about two things. 
call a bunch of friends, maybe half a dozen, get your coffee or your Cokes or whatever you want to drink, start reading about this and talking with each other, and then seeing what can we do tomorrow here supporting each other. I'm going to come back in a year and see how California is really doing. Th thank you very much. Thank you.